Friends, we're going to uh, read from the New Testament today before we stand for the reading of the word. That is our tradition here. We stand and hold still and take a breath and focus and listen when we read the word of God because we've come from all kinds of places today. And so we hold still together. We're reading from this little letter in the New Testament called Philemon. It's one chapter long, only one chapter long. Today, it's selected verses from this letter, Philemon, and I invite you to stand for the reading of the word. This is the Apostle Paul writing now. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. This is why I boldly ask a favor of you. Consider this as a request from me, Paul, an old man now, a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with this comes my own heart. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He's no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave, for he's a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you would consider, as your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or if he owes you anything, charge it to me, Paul. Paul, I write this with my own hand, and I will repay it, and I won't mention you owe me, you owe me your very own soul. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. I'm confident as I write this letter to you that you will do what I ask and even more. The word of God. You, you can be seated. If we want to know how to understand a Bible story, we simply look at the pictures. The pictures, right? You have an illustrated Bible in your home? We, we don't any longer. But if you want to know how tradition has understood a Bible story, simply look at the pictures we create for children, coloring book pages or illustrated storytelling. We're going to put my thesis to the test this morning. Watch a few illustrators, what they do with the story here of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. First up, this one's simple, one-shot picture. This is Paul, the old guy in prison. This is Onesimus. Somehow he got to where Paul is. Paul's giving him a talking to. You can see by Onesimus' face he has some feelings about this, right? That's the whole story for this illustrator. Here's the next illustrator. If you can read this, these friends have told us this, this, this letter, this lesson has a title. This is a lesson in forgiveness, all right? So they're going to help us understand it. Paul is a preacher and an apostle, and he's the good guy. And Philemon is a Christian, and he's a friend, and he will treat his slave like the brother, Philemon. And Onesimus, he's the runaway. He is useless. If you can look on the side, they've actually written these words for the children. In the past, he was a worthless slave. That's language that borrowed exactly from the Bible, verse 11, Philemon 1, 11. Here's a useless slave, but now he's a Christian and now he serves the Lord, so now he'll be useful to you. Let's keep going. Here is an illustrator that came up with 42 images. Let me pause. I'm not going to show you 42. <laughs> yes. This is a person with a big imagination for a tiny story. Do you have one of those in your family? We have one, a child who never really lands her stories. Well, here's one. Onesimus stole, so he ran, and so he crossed the sea from Colossae to Rome, and he ends up with Paul. And when he's with Paul, Paul has to talk him out of some things. You can see he's got the money bag right here with him. And uh, Paul actually converts him and sends him back home. Onesimus returns to Philemon. Philemon. And Philemon's angry, but he must take the letter out of his hand and read it and get the counsel from the Apostle Paul, and he welcomes him back home. And they end their story with this tagline for the children. Would you forgive? Next up is the children's curriculum used by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
This one is authored by our world headquarters on the East Coast. And I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but the Seventh-day Adventist curriculum has one picture. Nine pages of words, friends, we do like our words. And one picture. And in the one picture, you can see Paul is smiling and Onesimus is in trouble. And then there's nine pages of commentary on this, which is a lesson about learning how to serve, according to these storytellers. Let's do one more. Oh, by the way, these storytellers give this, this uh, lesson a title, Return of the Runaway. Return of the Runaway. You see, with every storyteller and with every set of images, they're telling us how to think about this story. Here's the last one we'll do this morning. And you'll need to kind of sit up straight and breathe. This is a theology lesson now for children. Are you ready? These illustrators want to read the story between Paul and Onesimus and Philemon as an allegory. So the way they would like the children to think about this is we are Onesimus, you and I, and we are owned, and we're owned by God who is played by Philemon in this story. God is the owner of all of us, and Paul is the mediator who stands in between the Jesus person who mediates and negotiates our reconciliation between the human slaves and the slave owner God. This is how these folks tell the story. If we want to know where our children get their ideas, we don't need to look any further than the pictures and the images and the graphics, whether it's in graphic novels, whether it's on the screen, whether it's meme, whether it's a video feed coming through TikTok, and, and if we want to know where adults get our ideas, we don't have to look any further than the way we were told stories and the way we tell stories. Ideas have histories. This is what we're considering today as we look at the second story in our series. Last week, we reflected on a scene from Noah's life. Noah comes out of the ark after the world has been washed in a drunken indiscretion. Noah is laying naked in his tent. His son comes in and sees him. The other two sons close their eyes, cover the body. For Ham's indiscretion in that moment, he is cursed, his line is cursed, and technically all the people throughout history who come from that family will carry this curse. Genesis 9, if we missed you last week, please go to the archives, because this short series belongs tightly together in one conversation. It is a reasonable question we could ask then, how it is in our country Christian slave owners, in more recent and modern times, Christian slave owners could whip a slave while quoting a Bible passage. And Christians could attend a lynching party on a Saturday night, but praise and pray all day Sunday. This is a reasonable question to ask. How is that possible? The Bible tells us so. On the foundation of these two stories, Noah and his curse, and Onesimus, the runaway slave sent home, a foundation of storytelling has happened. Now, church, this short series on racism has its own history. At the death of George Floyd in May of 2020, we told you last week that their pastoral team knew we needed a larger conversation. We needed a dialogue. With pandemic, we came with our masks, a few of us, maybe 100. We came to the parking lot. We said prayers. We confessed. We tied ribbons of healing and hope on the trees, and we went home. And we knew, your pastors knew, there's more here, but we are, we are all sequestered behind screens at home. That's not a way to have a dialogue. So we knew more was coming, and October is this more. October is us sitting still with you, now, when George Floyd, that, that death and that murder happened in May of 2020, we had black community members here who said to the pastors, why aren't you saying more? And I had black colleagues who said to me, will you say more? We had lighter-skinned community members who said, you've said too much. And we had lighter-skinned pastor colleagues who said, we don't condone slavery, everyone knows that. We're not wading into this stuff. Here's where we find ourselves this morning. 
your pastors believe we have to wade into this stuff. So here are the short goals for these four weeks in this series. We're not here to shame because shame doesn't belong in our stories, friends. We're not here to make people feel bad or sad. We're not here to drag up distant drama far from our church. We're not here to incite a rage that we cannot resolve. We're not here to be trendy or flashy or wind up a cause. We're here because we're the body of Christ. And like we said last week, we're with the man on the cross. So how does this obligate us? How does this obligate us as Christians in this culture? And how does it obligate us as Christians who are hopefully progressing? These are the questions for the month of October. Everybody okay? Are you okay, church? Here's the problem. There's a problem is that this is the gospel. And so we feel compelled to speak. Come with me back to the text, would you? Because the Bible tells us so. How do we resolve that if we're Christians with the Bible open? And I can tell you after 25 years in the ministry, I have more confidence in the Bible than I have ever had. So then how can we have this conversation with the Bible open? On the backs of Noah and his curse to his family and his generation and that line of humans... And Onesimus, who was not set free, but was told to go home and be a slave, we have built a foundation. It's problematic, but it's not the whole story. Because then we pick and pull some more texts, and we place them on the table, and we lump them together, and we assess. Here's a very short, a very short summary. Genesis chapter 9 was our Noah story last week. Noah's curse on Ham's family. Genesis 21 Hagar, the slave of Sarah, gives Abraham his first son named Ishmael, but they are banished by foot out into the desert and sent away. Genesis 41, we like to celebrate Joseph as a, a, a corporate ladder climber and he achieved in Egypt, but please remember he did Pharaoh's business. The Bible says he had slaves from one end of the country to the other that under Joseph's coordination, they made more grain than they could count. They stopped counting. Joshua chapter 9. These are the children of Israel, by the way. These are God's people now. Joshua 9, they run into a group of surviving Canaanites who should have been slaughtered, but they weren't. So Joshua curses them. He says to them, cursed are you. You will now be cursed in the service of the house of my God. You will be slaves and hewers of wood and drawers of water. If you're black and you were raised in a black home at a certain time in our country, it's possible that this text is familiar to you because your parents and your grandparents were determined you were going to go to school and determined you would succeed and determined you would have straight A's. Otherwise, this text, they would quote, you shall become slaves, hewers of wood, drawers of water, and you are better than that. I have never heard this text in my life. If we move to the New Testament, Jesus and Paul, they don't actually outright condemn slavery. In 1 Corinthians 7, the apostle Paul tells people, in whatever station you were in when you met God, stay there. In other words, you're free spiritually, even though you're held hostage here on earth. If you were a slave, remain a slave. If you're single, remain single, and on and on and on. Philemon 1, today, Onesimus, you will be returned to your master, not set free. Romans 13, where Paul tells the people, you'll obey the governments of the, the, the laws of the land. The government is to be obeyed. Ephesians, Titus, 1 Timothy, Colossians, that next to the last line, all of those little letters from the Pauline school, all of them say something very similar. Slaves, be obedient to your masters. And and finally, the prophets of Scripture in the New or Old Testament say that one day God will make this right. One day God will make things new. The institution of slavery is never condemned in the Bible. How shall we uh, read this Scripture? In large portions of our country, for generations, Slave owners quoted these passages, friends, and they concluded that God ordered this, 
that this actually is God's institution for an orderly world and an orderly country, that slavery is providential. In fact, if the slaves hadn't been brought and forced to this land and other lands, they never would have been converted and met God, and now God could save them for eternity. This is part of the way the story is told. And when your economic thriving depends on it, you will use God for this. When your economic thriving and excess depends on this, the Bible says a lot at that juncture. Nowhere is slavery condemned and everywhere it is practiced. So this leads Peter Gomes from the Harvard Memorial Church, a pastor and an author I have appreciated deeply. This is his conclusion of these passages. Slaves were free only to obey, and these arrangements were ordained by God, sanctioned by the patriarchs, tolerated by Jesus, approved by Paul, and enshrined in the Bible. Segregation, slavery, apartheid have roots in our sacred text, yet we know it's wrong, right? If we ask for a show of hands today, is this wrong? Would we all raise our hands? Yes. Is this wrong? Yes. How how is it we know that it's wrong, yet it's embedded in our sacred story? Dominating human symbols is wrong. Something inside of us tells us it's wrong, but this isn't just relativism. This isn't just a whim of an ethical idea. God places something deep inside of us we can pay attention to. And if you feel like me, um, please keep listening. If you, for me, have felt, I I wasn't there. I wasn't there hundreds of years ago. I wouldn't have done it this way. I didn't do this damage. I didn't abuse these passages. Do some of us kind of feel this way sometimes? I had a teacher in elementary school who kept trying to tell us how we were responsible we were for crucifying Jesus, and I was so confused as a child. I just kept saying, I wasn't there. All I knew how to say to her was, I wasn't there. I'm sorry, and I'm sad, and I wasn't there. If you feel like that this morning, please keep listening. Why, how is it we bear, can bear responsibility? The Bible is wildly clear that we are all in this together. For years, I thought of my salvation as a private event, as in Jesus died on the cross for me. And when I received that gift, that is my salvation. And then Jesus did the same for you and you and you and you and you. And the longer I've lived with our Christian story, the longer I've had my Bible open, I've come to understand that salvation is always personal, it's never private. It's intimate, but not individual. That God's salvation story is large. God is saving us, God is healing us. So your salvation matters to me. What's happening to all of humanity matters to us. I didn't approve of the misuse of the Bible hundreds of years ago, and also, if I'm silent today in speaking about this, then that makes me complicit. So we speak. We do not use the Bible this way. What can we do? What else can we do? I'm gonna share with you my short list if something here is meaningful If something stirs in your mind to expand this list, please do. What can we do knowing Christians are culpable? We've contributed to the shaping of a story that's hurt brown and black bodies. We can mourn that the Bible was used this way, and we can say that out loud. We can grieve that we've gashed people emotionally and physically and psychologically and spiritually. We can say so. We can say Christians were wrong about scripture and about using it this way. We can say we are sorry. We can say we commit to doing better. How do we do better with our Bibles open, church? On this one historical topic of slavery. Here's what happened hundreds of years ago. We began to interpret the Bible in unique ways and so we concluded that if it's not specifically forbidden in the Bible, then it must be permitted. If Jesus didn't say it and Paul didn't say it and we don't have a direct word from the Lord, it must be permitted. We know, practically speaking, that that's ridiculous. Your parents didn't tell you the million things not to do to kill your siblings, right? (laughs) If my mother had to make a list for all the nonsense my brother did, 
He would pick up a staple and run around the house like he's gonna staple all of us to a wall or shoot staples at us and took the TV remote and threw it out into the field so we'd have to run and the crazy making, if my parents had to think, list a million ways siblings could hurt one another. No, they taught us to take care of each other. This was our challenge when we began to interpret these texts hundreds of years ago. If the Bible didn't explicitly say it, it must be permitted, but that's actually not so. What we find in the Bible is a difference between biblical practice, Bible practice, and Bible principles. And let me say another sentence about that. There's Bible practice, there's the way they lived out their lives, but then there's an ideal, there's the biblical principle, there's a direction they're heading and aiming and where the Spirit is taking them. There is a biblical practice, there's a biblical principle. We have figured this out on other topics. For example, no one here has hundreds of concubines. If you do make an appointment with your pastor. <laughs> no one here has multiple spouses, men or women. No one here sanctions bloody massacres and says, God will it in the name of God. Even though we know in our Bible these things happened. There's biblical practice and there's biblical principles. The reason we're talking about this is because we need to be able to leave this space understanding how to talk about this. Seventh-day Adventist Christians have always believed that the biblical principles were the gold. We are looking for lively principles that rise above, and no one has helped me more than Ellen White. In my Bible, I have taped this paragraph. We've read it over and over the last dozen years. The Bible, she says, is written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put God's self in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not God's pen. So look at the different writers, she says. God as author is not on trial in the Bible. For me, this is among the most vulnerable experiences. God puts God's self in the space of letting people tell God's story. Would you do that? Why would you let your humans, your creation, tell your story, yet this is what God does? And so maybe the storytellers in Scripture need to tell stories a certain way. The Noah story. The thought is that the story is written down much later, much, much later. By then, perhaps the storytellers need to make it clear that the Canaanites were nasty people and are enemies, and there's a, a curse on an entire group of people because so much life has happened that we don't even know about. Or we get the Apostle Paul never specifically condemning slavery because he's trying to help a little emerging Jesus movement stay alive inside the Roman Empire. Because people want to kill him, so he keep kill them. So he keeps telling people, go home and cooperate and obey and 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 stay quiet because we're not we want we don't want to raise the radar around here. And while you're at it, the scandalous thing he said is treat your slaves better. He couldn't quite bring himself to say set your slaves free because this is where they live. This is what's going on in their time. It's also the Apostle Paul who says, we are all growing, being transformed and changing. God is making all of us new creations. So Paul says, above all, clothe yourself with love with which builds in us all together a perfect harmony. In the Bible, we're always looking for these lively principles that transcend the particular stories, principles of charity and compassion and, yes, forgiveness, principles of love that mean we love our neighbor and we love our enemy and we love the stranger within our gates. The Bible, it can inspire us beyond its own witness. Do you understand? The Bible can inspire us to be more than the Bible was show, showed us how to do. This is why we don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. So we can be careful how we interpret the Bible. The texts haven't changed, but maybe we have. And God holds us accountable to bring our best interpretation to these stories. What else can we do, friends? 
knowing Christianity has had a shaping of the trauma, we can ask those who are harmed to speak, and we can promise to listen. We can ask people who've been traumatized to speak, and we can promise them we will listen. It turns out in Philemon chapter one, the story that I would actually like to hear is the one Onesimus could tell. But we have one more story of a person being talked to, talked around, talked over, talked about, and one who never talks. This is a story about Onesimus without Onesimus. The story I'd love to hear, the story we could responsibly ask for is, what would Onesimus say if we put him in the middle of the, t- the, the room today? The sages from the African country of Benin say that until lions have their own historians, the tale of the hunt will always favor the hunter. Whew. The person I need to hear from today is Onesimus. What if Onesimus also had a spirit working inside of him? What if Onesimus also had an ethic he was aware of? It is not right for bodies to be held captive by other humans. What if Onesimus is intelligent and creative? What if he flees, not for the sake of being a fugitive, but he's seeking asylum? What if Onesimus is on the run to the apostle Paul because he thinks Paul can grant manumission, that Paul could release him from his slavery and make him a free man? The story I need to hear today is the story from Onesimus. We can insist on this in the body of Christ. The people who tell stories are the people who've been harmed. Will we listen? The resources that we've offered free at the doors today, the one book called Lead, most of the con- contributors are Seventh-day Adventists, but in this book, Lead, an-, an anti-racism challenge, the acronym Lead stands for Listen, Embrace, Advocate, Dream, and it gives us assignments so that we don't simply sit here and stew week after week after week. It gives us assignments. One of the assignments is listen to a person with bl- brown or black skin tell you their story and take note of when you cringed or flinched or felt uncomfortable or you were personally triggered. Make a note of that, your own listening exercise Every day has another short exercise like this, church family. This week to the tables out front, we add a wonderful book for the kids, Change Sings by Amanda Gorman, and we add a resource for the teenagers. That pa- Pastor Bev selected this one, and Pastor Ben selected uh, for the teenagers a book called This is an Anti-Racist. This book is anti-racist. This book also has assignments that you would need to make a little space in your life and sit still and think and reflect and watch a YouTube and and write out a paragraph or two. This is what we can do. This is how we make space for people who don't usually get to tell their stories to be guaranteed an audience in the body of Christ. This is how we grow. This is how we transform. This is how we change. We can change. We can change. In 1948, President Truman desegregated the military. 1948 is a year some of us remember. Some of us watching at home today. President Truman desegregates the military after World War II. President Truman was raised a Southern Baptist and In July of 1948, he signed legislation that desegregated the armed forces. He put together a presidential committee on equality and the treatment and opportunity of people in the armed services. And for this, he was attacked by Christian leaders around our country. Friends, this is only 1948, 70-some years ago. There were Christian leaders who told Truman, you cannot legislate morality. Look at the headlines, what was happening in newspapers. While this was going on, we're still talking about lynchings. Truman is a boy from Missouri, and his grandparents owned slaves. 
And he grew up in a state that lynched more people, the second highest lynching state outside of the South between the years of 1877 and 1950. More people were lynched in Missouri than most every other state, except for the Deep South. Last week we called this residue, right? What's the residue we carry? Truman was raised in this home and in the Southern Baptist tradition, good Bible reading, church going people. But what changed Truman's mind? And by the way, this is a journey. If we read autobiographies of this president, how did he change his mind? It was actually um, after the attack of Isaac Woodard in February that same year, Isaac was honorably discharged after serving in the army, riding a bus home to his home state, attacked on the bus, mutilated, permanently blinded for the rest of his life. Maybe many of you remember this story too. Woodard's home state would not open an investigation into the crime, so the president did. This is a picture of President Truman at the time that Woodard is signing his agreement with the VA, the Veterans Administration, for the benefits that will come to him now, permanently blind for the rest of his life. What changed Truman is putting Woodard in the middle of the story. What changed Truman was listening to Woodard talk about that day. This is the attack that sparked the civil rights activity in our country. And of that time, Truman said, my stomach turned over and over when I learned that Negro soldiers just back from overseas were being dumped out of army trucks and beaten. Whatever my inclinations as a native of Missouri might have been, now as president, I know this is bad. I shall fight to end this evil. And so he did. We are capable of changing our minds with the Bible open. We are capable of dreaming the dreams of Scripture. We are capable of the future that God points us to, friends, that we've not yet imagined. What a beautiful dream, La Sierra. What a beautiful dream. Amen.